Our first speaker tonight is Eric Allen. He joins us as an associate professor of marine biology and molecular biology at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and the Division of Biological Sciences and a faculty affiliate of the Scripps Center for Oceans and Human Health. His lab investigates the genomics of environmental microorganisms using high throughput DNA sequencing approaches and bioinformatic tool development. Tonight, he'll discuss the power and the promise of environmental genomics research and other current research underway at UC San Diego that is exploring the sources and the sinks of microbially produced organic contaminants in the marine environment. Please join me in welcoming Eric Allen. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Lauren, for that invitation, or for that introduction. <clears throat> Okay, so um, before I begin here, as an alum here of, of UC San Diego, it's a great honor and a privilege to present to you some of our research, and specifically on today's date, where we can acknowledge some of the, the intellectual architects of this great university that we all love. So today I'm going to also introduce you to a revolution going on right now that some of you are aware of and some of you might not be aware of. And specifically, that revolution is the genomic revolution. What we're seeing here is technological advances and our ability to decode the genetic information within a human being, within microorganisms, or any living organism on this planet. What we see here, some of you might be aware, the human genome has just recently celebrated its 10th year anniversary. Yay! <clears throat> In about 2003, the human genome was sequenced the three billion base pairs that are in each one of your cells. And that cost was about $3 billion, right? So that was the sequencing and also the analysis of that human genome. Now let's fast forward from 2003 up to 2013. In a modest 10 years, the price of performing high-throughput DNA sequencing has decreased more than 100,000-fold. To put that in context, some of you might be familiar with Moore's Law. This is an industry standard in technological advances that say computer chips are going to double in speed every year. We're far outpacing that trend with DNA sequencing. And part of that is compliments of San Diego-based companies like Illumina here, where we can literally get machines like this, the Illumina MySeq benchtop sequencer. We can put it in our own laboratories. Hell, you can put it in your kitchen if you wanted to. This little puppy right here, which is about this big, will sequence five, the equivalent of five human genomes in about 36 hours. And it'll cost a little less than $1,000 per human genome on one of these instruments. So a dramatic decrease. So what does this all mean? And why, what's driving all this technology, this advancement in DNA sequencing? Well, the, the answer is pretty simple. It's you. You're driving this, these technological advances in, in DNA sequencing for the purpose of personalized and preventative genomic medicine, right? And what we're working towards here and what most industry experts agree, if we can sequence a human genome for $100 or less, all of a sudden everybody in this room has the potential to have their genome decoded. And we can learn various things. For example, we can assess your risk for certain diseases across the board. We can even assay individuals for their propensity to cheat on their partners. Yeah, there's a gene for that. <laughs> True. So where do we now take this genomic technology that we have that's obviously being built for genomic medicine to better diagnose, provide better health care. I'm not going to go there on health care right now. Towards the $100 human genome, we can begin to go well beyond and co-op this technology and apply it to the environment. And this is something that we do in my lab. We now all of a sudden have an opportunity to assess global biodiversity at a very fundamental molecular level using genetic sequence information, genome sequence information. A little facts about, and specifically my lab, we're, we're microbiologists. We like to study the largest reservoir of cellular genetic diversity on this planet, bar none. Microbes on our planet. We live on a microbial planet. These microbes, as Shres mentioned, rule the planet. 
These are big numbers here. Five times 10 to the 30. Put that in context. That's 5,000 billion, billion, billion cells estimated. Believe me, nobody went out and actually counted these. It's just an estimate. About 100 million species, far outblowing the, the, the diversity in any other life form on this planet. And most of us, because we're a germophobic society in general, we tend to associate microorganisms, bacteria, as being pathogens, right? Evil, evil doers that are they're out to cause harm. In fact, less than one in 100,000 microbial species are pathogens. So we really don't have to, to worry about them as a, as a pathogenic um, group of organisms. And some of you might know this, the human body, there's 10 times more microbial cells in and on the human body than there are human cells. So in a lot of respects, you're actually more microbial than you are human. Think about that for a moment. So what do we study in my lab? We traverse the globe. We go to Antarctica. We go to the deepest depths in the Atlantic Ocean, the deepest depths in the Pacific Ocean. We collect water samples, sediment samples, fish samples, any samples we can get a hold of. We can extract DNA from these organisms, and we can perform high-throughput DNA sequencing. So I want to give you a couple of really quick facts about the ocean. Marine microbes, it's estimated that 70 to 90 percent of the microbial, of the biomass, excuse me, in the ocean is microbial. Single cell, small, little, tiny organisms. That's the equivalent of 200 in biomass, 200 billion African ele elephants, if we were to mass them all together. There's a lot of microbes out there. One drop of seawater contains approximately 50,000 bacteria in it. That's equivalent to the number of students, faculty, and staff here at UC San Diego. One drop. One drop contains that many bacteria. If we zoom in on that one drop and we look at it underneath a, a microscope, this is what you would see. They look like stars in the sky, right? And just as we've used technological advances in astronomy, bigger and better telescopes to see farther and farther into our, our galaxy and beyond, we can now use genomics as the new telescope for biology to peer into these organisms, which are unclassified. We don't know anything about these organisms. And the reason that we don't know much about these, less than 1% of the millions of bacteria that live in the ocean we can culture. We're all familiar with the Petri dish. This is what microbes would look like on a plate. We cannot culture these organisms. Less than 1% show up on those plates. So we have to rely on other methods to peer into their biology. If you were to zoom in on this a little bit more, this is what you would see, a very dynamic picture of warfare going on, synergism, competition, um, nutrient, cycling, nutrient cycling, et cetera. These little processes that are occurring in every single drop of seawater are really what mandate, or what dictate, I should say, the global carbon cycle, right? Climate, a variety of other big picture biosphere relevant issues are, are mediated by these smallest of microorganisms in the ocean. And we use genomics, because we can't culture it, we use genomics to provide insight, high throughput genomics, to provide insight into the biology of these organisms. And this is kind of a schema of how we approach our science. And I'll walk you through this very quickly. It's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. We can go out in the ocean. We can characterize any environmental sample, geochemistry, et cetera. We can access the microbes. We can perform DNA sequencing, this high throughput, like MySeq DNA sequencing. And we can reconstruct genomes of these organisms that we can't culture, we can't, we can't harness and cultivate in the laboratory. And we can make inferences about their biology and relate that back to how the environment works. And it's a very powerful method. We've generated terabases. That's 10 to the 15, or excuse me, 10 to the 12 uh, base pairs of DNA sequence information from various environments within the ocean. And I want to give you two vignettes on what we're working on right now. And one project you should all be familiar with, omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. This is why you're supposed to eat fish two times a week. What does this have to do with marine bacteria? Well, it turns out when I was a graduate student here at, at UC San Diego, at SIO, we found genes that are responsible for the production of these beautiful molecules. I find these beautiful, you might disagree. But these omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, we found that bacteria can produce these things. We cloned the genes out, and we've been able to characterize this new biosynthetic pathway and how you produce omega-3s. Some of you, and I should have said this earlier, might be more familiar with omega-3s as heart smart fats. Right? These are the good things for your heart. Heart healthy, anti-inflammatory, Reduce risk of atherosclerosis, thrombosis, hypercholesterol, uh, uh, um, cognitive performance. All these different uh, human health effects have been linked to a diet high in omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. But the Western diet, we don't get enough of these. We absolutely don't get enough of these. How many of you guys take um, the little polyunsaturated fatty acid pills in the morning? Yeah, me too. Load up about, I don't know, a couple grams a day. 
Um, woo. <laughs> but where does that come from? Those come from fish. Those come from fish in the ocean. You grind them up, you squeeze the oil out, you put it in a little drop, and you like, go on to work. This is not sustainable. We don't have enough fish in the ocean to meet the physiological needs of the population, all the health benefits omega-3s derive. So we're using genes from marine bacteria based on high-throughput DNA sequencing information to clone out these genes and design heterologous or recombinant organisms. I know that might be a bad word to some of you, but looking for new mechanisms to actually purify omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids and put them into the human diet by other means. These are not from pathogens. These are from tasty, tasty marine bacteria. They're not pathogenic, they're not harmful. So we're actively looking to engineer yeast strains that can produce bread with omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. I have a graduate student in my lab, true story. His first year project right now is to clone these genes into yeast to brew a batch of beer that has omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids in it. I'll try it. <laughs> the other thing we're working on is we can use these exact same genes and these molecules to investigate potential avenues for liquid fuel replacements. These big molecules you see here, just a bunch of carbon and a bunch of hydrogen, those things will burn in a diesel engine, no problem, right? So we're using those same genes to engineer production platforms for synthesizing new molecules that can be used as liquid fuel replacements. And one of those things that, that uh, specifically we're looking at is taking those omega-3s and cracking them converting those into hydrocarbons, which again, will combust in an engine. All come from marine bacteria that were discovered using genomics. The last thing I want to hit on for the last minute and a half or so is a truly collaborative uh, entity that's happening that I think really um, epitomizes the, the, the core um, concept of, of the, the Founders Symposium, the Founders Week here, which is Tritons United, right? So here, Recently established, we have the Scripps Center for Oceans and Human Health. And this is a collaborative opportunity between Scripps, uh, a professor at San Diego State funded by the National Institutes of Health and NSF. This collaborative project is biochemist, genome scientist, bioinformaticist like my group. We have natural products chemists, organic chemists, as well as environmental chemists, and three, P three MDs from the School of Medicine here at, U at, UC at UCSD. And the goal of this project is very simple. Unlike, yet complex. Major unknowns concern not necessarily those beneficial compounds that we saw before with the omega-3s, but some of these compounds. You don't need to know too much about these to say, they probably don't taste very good, right? This is stuff you do not want in your seafood, right? But these are produced by, guess what? Microorganisms. We can detect these in top predators. We can detect those in these, mo these molecules in the human population. They're thyroid um, disruptors. They've been shown linked to uh, causing cancer. And these things get produced by microorganisms, which are then consumed by smaller, small organisms, which are consumed by little fish to big fish, the marine food web. So we're tracing, taking a comprehensive view of the production and the fate of these molecules all the way up to humans. And that's all research that's being conducted here. Because right now, it was assumed that all these molecules were produced industrially and were just deposited into the ocean. But just very recently, we discovered microbial genes in genetic data sets that when we clone those genes out, we can get production of this whole collection of compounds, and they're identical to the ones that we find in top predators within the ocean, including you. And that's all I have to say tonight. <laughs>